Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the webinar. My name is Phoebe Potter, and I'm a Senior Policy Analyst at the Council of State Governments Justice Center, and we'll be presenting today along with Dr. Gary Dennis, Senior Policy Advisor for Corrections from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice. Thanks to all of you for joining the webinar. Before getting started, I'd like to briefly talk through a couple of house cleaning items about how the webinar is going to work. Anytime during this webinar, you can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. This includes both technical and content-related questions. We will try to reply to any technical questions in the chat window as we go. For the content-related questions, we will keep a running list and address them all during the last 30 minutes of the webinar. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible, um, but if we miss any due to time, please not hesitate to reach back out to us with your questions. We will have our contact information available. If you encounter any technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Please understand that there are some technical issues you may not be able to resolve. For this reason, we are recording the content portion of this webinar and we'll post it on our website at cscjusticecenter.org backslash NRC. We should have the webinar posted online early next week. Once it has been posted, we will email you a link to the recording. Before starting the presentation, I want to give you a little bit more background on the Council of State Government's Justice Center and the National Rancher Resource Center. The Justice Center is a national nonprofit organization that serves policymakers at the local, state, and federal levels from all branches of government. Staff provide practical, nonpartisan advice and evidence-based, consensus-driven strategies to increase public safety and strengthen communities. The National Interest Resource Center is funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance and managed by us here at the Justice Center. The NRC provides support to Second Chance Act grantees across the field, as well as to the broader field. We are constantly adding new content and resources to our website and we send out a monthly newsletter that provides information about the latest research, funding opportunities, distance learning events, and other news about reentry. To sign up for the newsletter, please visit the link on your screen after, or after today's webinar. With that, we will begin the webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about four different topics today, um, all related. Um, to start, we're going to go over uh, a quick introduction to the reentry employment project with a focus on the white paper, um, which this project is founded on and the pilot site project will be based upon. Um, this will give you some important background on the origin of the pilot site opportunity. We will then talk about the pilot project itself, um, both, you know, what will be expected for pilot sites, um, as well as what would make a competitive proposal to become a pilot site. We will then talk about the specifics of the application process. And lastly, um, provide some details on what's next in terms of next steps. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gary Dennis from the Bureau of Justice Assistance to say a few words about the Reentry Employment Project and both its origin um, and BJA's investment in this effort. Uh, thanks very much, Phoebe, for giving me an opportunity to participate in the webinar. This is a, a very important project for the Office of Justice Programs as well as the Bureau of Justice Assistance, of, of which we're a part of that larger organization. You know, it's interesting, I'm sure there are lots of folks who are on this webinar who've been in the field for a long time. I worked for 34 years in the Department of Corrections in Kentucky starting in 1970, and I can remember when someone would go before the parole board for consideration for release, if they had a clean institutional record, the parole board asked two questions. They said, do you have a place to live, and do you have a job? And they didn't go much deeper into that in terms of what kind of living arrangements do you need supportive housing, or what kind of job do you have? Is it going to pay you enough to, to live on? So we recognized that employment was a major part of reentry, but it could also be an obstacle to that. The, the fact that a person just has a job is, is not enough. So we were struggling with how to overcome this uh, sense that uh, just having a job, any job would be all right. And what happened? What we found, of course, was then looking at the research that simply having a job was not necessarily a major indicator of success. And in fact, so many of the people who were immediately employed upon release uh, from incarceration were folks who would have found a job on their own. They didn't really need to be helped. 
and because we were sort of meddling in their affairs, sometimes our attempts to uh, help them out actually made them worse. So we brought together the best minds and the corrections, the reentry and workforce development areas. Our friends and, and uh, partners over at the Department of Labor have certainly have been working on employment-related projects uh, through uh, the old uh, you know, prisoner reentry initiative, PRI, as well as the uh, new Rexel program under Second Chance. So we came together and worked with the Council of State Governments as our technical assistance provider, brought the focus groups together, and what we developed was this project white paper that we're going to talk about, as well as what was referred to, is referred to, I like to call it a sorting instrument. But this particular project is, is a, one of the classic examples of a priority of the Obama administration and Attorney General Holder and our Assistant Attorney General Carol Mason. This is not only a collaborative effort um, uh, between federal partners, the Department of Justice and the Department of Labor, but the Annie and Casey Foundation, a private philanthropic organization, uh, has also contributed. Excitement has been building uh, over the last year, even though we've been working on this for almost four years. But things came to a head a couple of weeks ago. We had two major events over at the White House uh, that were sponsored by the Obama administration through the Domestic Policy Council, where we brought folks together to talk about this white paper. And you'll see, I think, on the next slide, uh, Secretary of Labor Tom Perez and uh, the Commissioner of Corrections John Wetzel in Pennsylvania, who is very excited about this. And then the other person there is my old friend, uh, Congressman Danny Davis from Illinois, who is affectionately known as the father of uh, Second Chance. So we are very excited about this project unfolding. Uh, we are particularly excited about the opportunity that Phoebe's going to talk to you now about uh, us moving into actually testing this in the field uh, with uh, agencies that are motivated and understand the dynamics of reentry and have committed to a wraparound approach. And uh, seeing, and I'm confident that this approach is going to work and it's going to help us significantly reduce the barriers that folks uh, face in reentry. So, you know, I like to talk to you, but I think I've said enough, so I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Dennis. That was a really great summary, I think, of the momentum at the federal level and state level around this project um, and the opportunity that you all have now to um, bring the, the momentum down to the local level and, and really um, see what it means to, to put this into practice. So with that, I'm going to do a, a quick introduction or overview of, of the project, the, the motivation behind it, as well as the takeaways from the white paper um, so that you'll kind of understand the principles that you would then be uh, testing in your pilot site. So for starters, and I doubt this is news to most people on this webinar, um, but the scope of the reentry challenge is, is quite significant. There's very high numbers of people um, incarcerated or under correctional supervision, either probation or parole. And what we know from a public safety perspective is that most of those individuals are going to return home to their community, um, but also that very high rates of individuals um, are recidivate um, upon their release to the community for many different reasons. Um, the most recent statistics suggest that around Almost 70% of state prisoners are rearrested in three years of the release, and 50% are reincarcerated in three years. This obviously has really important implications from an employment perspective as well. Um, some staggering statistics, if you look at this in terms of uh, individuals that are incarcerated versus employed for some of the uh, highly incarcerated populations, um, it's quite staggering. We know that spending time incarcerated um, can have major impact on employment outcomes post-release post from uh, prison or jail. Um, and so you see the data here that serving time has been shown to reduce hourly wages by 11%, annual employment by nine weeks, and annual earnings by 40%. So major impact there. Um, and it goes beyond the individuals um, that are returning home. You also have 2.7 million children in the U.S. with a parent behind bars. Um, and what we find is that family income is reduced 22% while the father is incarcerated. So this is data from the Pew Charitable Trust um, and really, again, um, signals, signifies the importance of the, of the challenge um, and the reason that this project um, has been a major priority for us here at the Justice Center and for our federal and private partners. So the question we posed um, four years ago when this project started um, is how do we break this cycle of, um, you know, 
lowered employment prospects resulting from people being incarcerated, which of course leads to um, an increased rate in failed reentry and, and kind of the continual um, struggle that people face returning home. And what we found, again, as Dr. Dennis kind of alluded to, is that for this particularly disadvantaged population, people returning home from prison and jail who are oftentimes um, very uh, disconnected from the labor market, the job placements alone are not sufficient. Um, just connecting somebody with a job opportunity does not mean they're going to stay with the job. They're not necessarily going to succeed in the job. And it hasn't been shown to reduce recidivism. What we really need is an integrated approach that addresses, addresses individuals' unique needs, both around uh, reentry, but also around employment, and provide a more comprehensive, holistic package to our services. So employment is incredibly important, but to assume that just a job placement alone will do the trick um, is, is not correct. So how do we get there? Um, we want to make the most of our limited time and resources, and this is critical um, on, at the ground level, um, as, as all of you know. Um, there's not an uh, infinite amount of resources, and so how can we partner to leverage our limited resources more effectively? That's the whole goal of this white paper. And so what we found is that there's a lot of parallels between the workforce development and the corrections in the reentry field. Both are assessing individuals to understand their needs. In workforce development, we see um, what we call job readiness assessments or employability assessments. Um, they use those assessments and determine what skill deficits there may be and, ad and address those with programming. Um, and there's also oftentimes case management or wraparound support provided through these um, workforce development providers. On the corrections and reentry side, similar. We're assessing, in this case, we're using a risk and need assessment to understand what are the factors underlying the likelihood that somebody is going to reoffend or recidivate when they get out from prison or jail? We'll talk more about those assessments later in the presentation. Then we want to address the needs that lead to reoffending. And again, that case management and wraparound support are provided. And so our goal with the white paper is to start to, to de-silo these two fields and think about one client, one plan, um, using an integrated assessment tool that looks at both risk need and job readiness providing integrated treatment for those different sets of needs, and providing a coordinated case plan. So here's a quick summary of the white paper. Um, so in addition, you can see the cover here of the white paper, and, and this can be accessed on um, the Justice Center website. Um, and the resource allocation service matching tool copied here um, is kind of a punch of the white paper. It basically says, this is the model that you'll want to follow to develop that integrated approach that I was talking about. And it talks about assessment, um, both of risk and needs, and of job readiness, and then matching people to the appropriate types of services based on those assessment results. So here's just a little bit closer up, and this is the first two layers of the resource allocation and service matching tool. And again, this is um, kind of the crux of the white paper and what you would be looking to implement as a pilot site. Um, so for starters, we want to assess individuals, um, risk and needs, and job readiness to group people. Um, and so here are the criminogenic risk and needs factors that we're talking about. Um, and these are based on a long history of research that says that these are the most predictive factors of reoffending among people released from prison and jail. Um, and it's important to emphasize kind of these top four pieces, these what we call the big four risk factors uh, in the criminal justice field. Um, that are the most predictive of recidivism. Um, it's important to note here, too, and I'm doing a, a very quick overview of, of this principle, so please reference the white paper if you have any questions about this coming out. But these are the dynamic predictors of recidivism. So what that means is these are factors that we know are predictive and we can also change. Um, there are many other static factors, age, number of prior offenses, age at first arrest that also predict recidivism, but those aren't things we can change, so they're not the emphasis here. So why do we assess for risk and need? Um, basically, you know, the punchline here is that it tells us who will benefit from intensive services. This slide is um, the result of a meta-analysis of um, Intensive programming provided to individuals um, transitioning out of prison through halfway houses. And so they provided case management um, and, and comprehensive treatment and programming. So these bars indicate um, how much um, outcomes were either improved or actually made worse for the participants in these programs based on their level of risk, so the likelihood that they would reoffend. And what you see here is that for high-risk people, the people that are most likely to reoffend, there's big improvements in your outcomes, meaning reduced recidivism. So that's that green bar there. 
For moderate risk people, you still have pretty strong um, impacts. That's the red bar. But when you look at low moderate people, there's really no effect of receiving that treatment. And for low risk people, these are folks who have stable support from the community, maybe one first offense, um, they might be older, they're kind of ready to turn their lives around. These are the folks that you don't need to spend a lot of intensive resources on. And in fact, what the research shows is that if you do spend too much time uh, programming these individuals, you can make them worse off. Um, and I think this is a factor that is surprising to a lot of people, but very important to know. Um, and there's kind of two theories behind why that's the case. Um, one, intensive programming is uh, naturally kind of disruptive to other things going on in your life. It means a lot of hours spent in programming that you're not spending with your family, um, that you're not spending with your other natural supports in the community, and we don't want to disrupt those natural supports. So that's one reason you see negative effects. The other reason is that low-risk people, um, when mixed into a program with high-risk people, so these are people that um, they have kind of anti-social thinking patterns, they're not ready to change, they have very entrenched criminal thinking, you can actually have kind of a negative peer association effect um, where the lowest people are made worse off by associating with those higher risk individuals. So, um, again, a very quick overview of this risk principle, but the takeaway here is that we cannot treat low risk people and high risk people, and again, risk of reoffending, not dangerousness, just the likelihood that they're going to get in trouble when coming home from prison or jail um, in the same types of programs and expect the same types of outcomes. So I think for the reentry instructional professionals on the phone, that might be familiar to you. But for workforce development folks, this might be new. Um, you might be asking, why should I care about recidivism or reoffending? I'm here for employment purposes. Um, but the reality is that these big four criminogenic needs that I uh, mentioned earlier really affect one's ability to find and retain gainful employment. Um, we're talking about attitudes on the job, valuation of work, self-control and self-regulation, problem solving and coping skills. Um, so these are all factors that, you know, are caught up in those criminogenic needs, um, but also can impact employment outcomes. So we want to address criminogenic factors in our programming if we want to see employment outcomes. On the flip side, it's important that reentry professionals don't just look at those four um, criminogenic risk factors that I, uh, or eight criminogenic risk factors listed on the left-hand side of this slide here. They also need to think about job readiness factors, and so this is where the benefit of an integrated approach comes comes into play. Um, so you can see here um, on the left hand side the bolded the bolded bullet low levels of performance and satisfaction in work. This is a predictor of uh, rates of reoffending. If people aren't performing well, they're not satisfied with their job. Um, that's going to affect how well they do in the community when they get home from prison or jail. Um, but the factors that underlie performance and satisfaction in work are all around job readiness and employability. So this is, again, where that connection comes in. Um, and it's important that if you are a reentry professional providing employment services, that you understand the underlying job readiness factors that your clients face, education level, vocational skills, work experience, soft job skills. Um, all of these things listed here are going to be important for you to be assessing and accounting for in your um, in your services. So that's how we end up with our four groupings. And so what you'll see here um, on the top of the chart, and this is the resource allocation and service matching tool again, is the lower risk, more ready group one. So these are folks who are less likely to be reoffending. They don't have as many of those dynamic predictors of reoffending. Um, and they're also more ready for a job. Uh, they have some basic skills. They have work experience. They don't need a very intensive approach. And so that's group one. Group two is your lower risk folks as well. So similar similar characteristics in terms of their likelihood of reoffending, but these folks are less ready for a job. Um, you know, they may have a, a poor history of employment. Um, they may never have finished their high school diploma or gained a GED. So they're going to need a different type, a different workforce development approach to prepare them for the job. On the right hand side of the slide. These are our higher risk individuals. So we know that they have a very high prevalence of those chronogenic risk factors that are making them more likely to reoffend when they get back out to the community. And so we need to take care of those issues. But there's still diversity among that population as well. Some folks might be more ready for a job and some are less ready. So we need to break out that group as well. So that's how you end up with these four packages of clients. 
And what you want to make sure you do then is provide tailored services to meet each of those four groups and unique needs, and that is the whole crux of the white paper. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what those service packages look like. There's two different elements that we talk about in the white paper that compose the service delivery packages. So one is workforce development program components. So this is what services we're providing, and it's driven by that job readiness assessment. And so for more job ready people, again, people that have decent skills, they have a high school diploma, maybe a higher education than that, um, a fairly steady history of employment, our focus should not be on more education or soft skill development. That's a waste of our resources there. We want to put them right into finding and retaining employment. And so we want to do job development and coaching. We want to think about retention and advancement, long-term connection to the workforce. However, for less job ready people, our primary focus needs to be on promoting job readiness. It shouldn't be immediate job placement because these folks aren't ready to hold a job. So here we want to do some education and training and soft and cognitive skill development. We want to connect them to employment as quickly as possible for stability purposes, but we need to be providing that job readiness um, as, as part of our employment package. So that's what we do, and that would be broken down across the spectrum of more or less job ready. So where does the risk factor come in, risk of reoffending? This is what we call service delivery principles. So it's really how you're going to deliver those workforce services that I just talked about. And that should be driven by risk. So for lower risk clients, you can really treat them like anybody else coming to your door, whether they have a criminal record or not. Um, they do not need really specialized intensive services. Um, and uh, really, again, just need to focus on the workforce development aspect of your treatment. They may need some special assistance around disclosure on their criminal record or finding jobs that don't have legal barriers. But again, that's not an intensive service. That's just something you want to be informed about. It looks very different when you work with the higher risk clients. Here you need to address, again, those big four criminogenic needs that I talked about, those antisocial personality patterns, criminal thinking, peer associates, um, factors that we know are associated with higher rates of reoffending, and we do that through the use of what we call cognitive behavioral interventions, and through really providing intensive structured engagement. So big difference, not necessarily on the workforce um, services we're providing, but on how we deliver those services and how we bundle them into um, a service package. And I'm going to illustrate uh, later in the presentation an example of a program that kind of does this model. So that's kind of the different pieces of, of the resource allocation and service matching tool and what we're encouraging. So now I'm going to kind of talk about what that looks like in practice. Um, and the term that we uh, are using in the slides here is client matching, right? So we want to assess people's needs, and then we want to match those clients to the right provider based on how well equipped they are to provide those tailored service packages. So on this screen, it's an illustration of what client matching would look like at a system level. And so basically here what's happening is corrections when people are about to be released from prison or jail, your corrections agency is assessing these individuals for both their criminogenic risk, likelihood of reoffending, and their job readiness. And you're sorting people, right, from kind of the dark red for the higher risk, less ready, down to the dark blue, which is like good to go, low risk, more ready. Um, and you kind of have those four groupings right off the bat. And then you're identifying which of your treatment providers works best with each of these four different types of people and matching people directly that way. Now, the key to making a system-level approach like this work is you really need a very wide range of providers in the community that can provide unique service packages. So it kind of implies a pretty rich network of community providers, and we know that's not always the case in every jurisdiction. As such, you can also think about client matching at a program level. So here, maybe there's only one big provider um, that does kind of employment and reentry treatment in your community, and everybody's showing up at the front door. Then it's really the responsibility of the program to get the right risk assessment information from the parole or probation officer or the corrections agency to understand that, to also do the job readiness assessment, and then to have four distinct service tracks based on the needs of, of that population. So. Um, so this puts the onus really on the program to do the assessment and the sorting process. The key of success here is that if you're a single provider doing this, you need a lot of capacity. Um, you need to be able to do four different service tracks, and you need to manage your flow of clients in a way that you're minimizing contacts between low-risk and high-risk clients because of the risk of having that negative peer association that I talked about earlier. So where does that leave us? 
Um, the third option in terms of implementing this, this service matching or client matching model is kind of a hybrid approach where corrections uh, agencies are distinguishing low-risk clients from high-risk clients, right? So that's the risk of reoffending. They're making some referral decisions um, based upon that, you know, single dichotomy of low versus high risk. And then the service providers are thinking about how to layer in the job readiness. And so as a provider, you say, I work best with lowest clients, and I'll take it upon myself to figure out what I do with my more job ready clients and what I do with my less job ready clients. So that's what's illustrated on this slide. Um, so there's some different ways to think about client matching. And as a pilot site, we would be working with you to kind of identify which model really works best. So that's a very quick overview of the white paper because I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about the pilot project itself. But again, I encourage you to look at the white paper if you have questions. Um, you know, we have additional training materials about the white paper available on our website. Please reach out to me if you have more questions about this content. I'd be happy to connect you with the right resources. And now I'm going to transition and talk about what we're looking for out of the pilot project itself. So what is this pilot project? Um, it's a three-year effort to implement that resource allocation and service matching tool or client matching model within a local jurisdiction and to really evaluate its impact. This is kind of an innovative approach, and we are really looking for some specific concepts about how this can be done to inform the larger field. Scientific outcome that it's going to help um, reduce recidivism and improve employment outcomes among the target population. Um, but it's also our, our hope that it also informs the field um, more broadly about what best practices look like. There are kind of two layers of, of impact here. If you're selected as a pilot site, you will receive intensive technical assistance coordinated by us here at the Council of State Government's Justice Center, and we have a range of kind of partners that will help us deliver that PA. And we'll be there every step of the way to help um, kind of do the necessary data analysis, um, inform the revision of policies, building program capacity, kind of walking you through this implementation process. This work is supported by the U.S. Department of Justice and the Annie Casey Foundation, and we have guidance from the U.S. Department of Labor. And lastly, solicitations are due to us by August 15th. So this is just a snapshot of what the pilot project is. I'm actually going to turn it back over to Dr. Dennis again, um, who kind of talked about the large vision of the project itself, but I'd love for him to talk a little bit about the Bureau of Justice Assistance's vision for um, this pilot project specifically. Thanks, Amy. Uh, as I indicated earlier, this, this is a very uh, significant effort on our part. And one of the things, of course, that the uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance does is to provide individual grants and aid under the Second Chance and lots of other programs so that you actually have hard cash federal dollars coming. And interestingly enough, you know, this is, this is not going to be one of those things where we're going to come to you with a big fat check or I'll be showing up on your doorstep with a bag of money. But we think that the intensive technical assistance and the involvement of the Council State Government's Justice Center is actually more valuable than somebody writing a check to you because they have years and years of experience uh, in helping uh, agencies to better develop their reentry programs around all aspects of reentry including uh, employment. So becoming a site, uh, one of the pilot sites, I think is going to be a very, very exciting opportunity. Unfortunately, at this point now, we'll probably only be able to fund two, maybe three. We're hoping that between labor and us, and, and particularly with the uh, priority that the domestic policy council will get somewhere down the pipe, we'll be able to do more of this. But the, the two sites initially that are selected for this will be really on the cutting edge of policy, and I think that it will give the leadership in the reentry area in those particular jurisdictions an opportunity to uh, to really shine. You know, we're making an investment, a significant investment in this, as is the Department of Labor and the Casey Foundation. And we know that, that the emphasis on employment and particularly the effective use of our resources, and I'm not going to replow the ground that maybe did such a great job of explaining, but, you know, we've got to be a lot more uh, – specific about the people that we target our services for, because even though the Second Chance Act, uh, compared to a lot of other federal programs, has been re relatively well-funded, you know, that's, that's not going to last. And so we're going to be called upon, I think, uh, as the Attorney General has said so many times, to really act smarter on crime and not just throw resources at it. So we encourage you uh, to apply to be one of the pilot sites. Uh, I think it's going to be a great privilege and an honor if you're selected, and not only 
uh, with that, but it will also show your commitment uh, to effective reentry and to a more targeted use of resources. And what we anticipate will happen is that the target sites will really become learning sites, if you will, across the nation through some, some additional uh, white papers and information that CST will develop so that uh, it's an opportunity to really be out front in leadership and be a pace setter. So I hope that everyone who's on the call will will be interested in applying. Uh, we're looking forward to some great applications. And I think now Phoebe's probably going to talk a little bit more about some of those specifics. Phoebe? Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Dennis. Um, so we're now going to go into some of the basics that I think people were, were hoping to hear about the pilot project. Um, and just for starters, in terms of total capacity, what you're going to hear is that this is a very intensive pilot site effort. And so at this point, we're committing to selecting two new pilot projects to initiate the effort. Um, our hope, of course, is to expand this, this over time, but that is our commitment currently in this round is to select two pilot sites to work with. Um, the eligibility requirements I've shown here um, are, are pretty broad. Um, really, any state, county, or municipal jurisdiction is, is able to apply. Um, you know, if you're a state, you may want to apply with a target site in mind, um, a specific large county or, or urban setting. Um, that you want to focus on for the initiative. We just ask that the lead applicant um, include the corrections agency that has supervising authority um, over the population that you would be working with. So the parole um, agency, probation agency, um, the state DOC, if they oversee supervision. So you're going to need those people at the table. Um, and ideally, they should be co-applicants um, with a community-based provider, um, and we'll talk more about the different people that should be at the table. So really you're committing your full, full jurisdiction um, to the efforts, defining kind of the target population based on what uh, geographic region you're targeting, and then you're going to want corrections, workforce providers, um, community-based providers, all at the table working on this collaboratively. The target population um, will be individuals returning home from prison or jail to that selected pilot uh, jurisdiction that you've identified um, that, and that are returning, obviously, during the pilot period. We just request, require that people be under correctional supervision to be part of the target population. This is essential for kind of doing the assessment process that we're talking about. Um, the specific number of individuals served is really going to be driven by the size and the programming capacity of the selected jurisdiction. So can't say offhand exactly how many people will be served. Um, that would be determined um, through a collaborative dialogue with you as an interested site in terms of what capacity could be supported. The program length is up for three years. Um, so that would be one year planning data analysis, figuring out what it would look like to be client matching in your jurisdiction, one year of implementation, and then one year of evaluation. Um, and we'll talk through that in more detail. But you must meet kind of annual milestones to move to the next phase. So um, and we'll elaborate on those as well. So the program structure, as I mentioned, is a three-year process. Um, year one will be spent convening all the right stakeholders in your jurisdiction, um, then conducting kind of a data analysis or program review to get all the information that you need to kind of build a client matching system, and then spending time with developing your, your plan and building your capacity to implement the plan. Year two is full-on implementation. So you'd be doing the assessments, matching people to the program, tracking their outcomes in the program, um, and doing kind of a process evaluation to make sure that everything is working the way it's supposed to work. Year three is when you kind of monitor the target population's progress um, and evaluate the impact of the change um, from the pilot site work. So here's an elaboration on that first year, the planning year. Um, ideally, you spend the first two months um, just establishing your steering committee that's going to work with your technical assistance provider. Um, and again, this should be a very collaborative body. It should have policymakers, it should have corrections practitioners, reentry providers, workforce development professionals. Anybody who'd be impacted by a system uh, change like this should be at the table and represented. We then spend the next three months doing a data analysis to start to understand the characteristics of that target population, understanding their risk for things, their readiness for things, and coming up with that kind of um, assessment sorting mechanism. 
the next three months we'll be looking at the other side of the client matching process, which is the programs and understanding their capacity and who they are best equipped to work with. So we would be inventorying the services available in the community and trying to understand um, who, you know, which types of individuals the programs in the community are best equipped to work with. And then we would de develop a strategic plan that explains what your client matching process would look like based on those two different assessments and building your service capacity. So I want to give an example of, of what this could look like in practice. Um, New York State has been working on a very similar process um, through what they call their Work for Success Initiative. Um, and the tagline for that, which is um, established by executive order from the governor, is to match the right people to the right services at the right time. So very much a client matching model. And the question they're asking is who is coming back to our community and what services are available to meet these individuals' unique needs. Um, I'm just going to show you two little bits of information from the Work for Success effort. Um, it's very comprehensive. There's a lot to it. I'd recommend that you actually look it up. That They have a website. Very interesting. Um, but the two things I want to flag for you is kind of the data analysis of the target population that they did, as well as their program review, so you can get a sense of what that might look like. Um, the folks from New York State, driven by the corrections agency, um, looked at their kind of risk uh, groupings, and so you have three bars here. Um, the first are the clients who are low risk, so less likely to reoffend, and also have low kind of criminogenic needs. They are supervised at the lowest intensity level. Then you have a group of folks who are low risk but with more needs, so they get a little bit more supervision um, to make sure they're getting their necessary treatment. And then you have your high risk group, um, so that's the bar on the right hand side. Within that group, or within each of those groups, they also look at job readiness to say, um, you know, are people who are high risk less job ready? You know, is there actual diversity within our risk group? And it turns out there is. Um, you can't assume that every person who is at a high risk of reoffending is not job ready. That's not actually the case. As you see here, about 40% of the folks were job ready. 16% um, were close. 45%, however, were not job ready and really needed some more intensive services. Um, low risk people do tend to be more job ready than high risk though. So this is the sort of data you're going to want to start to look at and that we would help to develop as part of the pilot project. The second slide is New York State's review of community programs. And there's three different um, uh, variables that are captured in this slide. So each column uh, in this chart represents a different type of workforce development service um, or that workforce development programming component that we talked about. They have soft skill training, cognitive behavioral training, occupational training, transitional jobs. Um, so breaking it down by the type of employment program. So as far as indicate how many providers actually are out there in the community doing these types of services. So a lot of people are doing soft skill training. A lot of people are addressing non-skill related barriers. But there's far fewer that are doing cognitive behavioral training and transitional jobs, right, because those are more intensive services. In addition to looking at how many programs are providing these services, they also thought about how intensive are the services. Are they really structured? Are we engaging people, um, you know, most hours of the day? Are we kind of providing that wraparound support? All those things you mentioned earlier are important for high-risk clients. And so that's what the color coding shows. So, for instance, soft skill training, that first column, seven programs do soft skill training, but only one of them um, delivers it with a low amount of intensity. Three of them deliver it with a medium amount of intensity, and the top three, the gray part, deliver soft skill training with high intensity. So, this, again, is kind of an illustration of the type of assessment we'd be doing. This is not easy work, um, it, you know, which is why we have a year built in for kind of this planning and data analysis phase. So to wrap up that first phase, we want to hit milestone one, right, which is um, kind of an indication that you have the ability to implement an efficient risk and job readiness assessment process, um, that you're able to implement a referral process in partnership with corrections to match clients to people based on those assessments, and then you'll be able to reallocate resources as needed to kind of give the right type of intensity for high-risk clients, if necessary. So that's year one. Year two is the implementation year. And so what you're looking at here is actually implementing that plan that you wrote in year one. And so you spend the first, first four months ensuring um, that the risk and job readiness assessment and referral process is working well. Another four months action is ensure that the programs have the capacity that they need to work with high-risk clients. 
and then four months doing a process evaluation to ensure that everything is implemented um, the way it needs to be. So here's going back to the New York State example, just to kind of bring the example home. Um, so they did their assessment. They understood what their clients looked like. They understood what the providers in the community were able to deliver. Um, and so they decided to start matching people based on those two assessments. New York State is doing this on a limited pilot basis currently. Um, but what they're doing is assessing individuals prior to release to the risk and needs assessment and making sure that their parole supervision intensity matches that risk level. And making sure that the parole officers have that information when, the, when folks are released so they can use the information to make a referral decision. So that's the assessment box. On the referral side, what they're doing is low-risk clients are being directed to um, career centers, which are more traditional one-stop career workforce development programs that the State Department of Labor operates. And so when they arrive at the career centers, the lowest clients are then further assessed for job readiness needs and given the right set of services for uh, their specific needs. So this is kind of that hybrid approach I talked about earlier. High-risk clients are being directed to um, the Center for Employment Opportunities, which is a very intensive uh, program model, which I'll talk about a bit here. Um, and the staff there are able to meet with the individual um, who educates them about their program. So I'm going to go through this quickly here. Um, the Center for Employment Opportunities, this is a very much an example of what um, a program for a high-risk, high-need, um, not job-ready individual um, would look like. And so they have very, they do transitional job uh, placements in a very structured setting. Um, they're engaging people on a work through model. Um, they're providing soft skill development um, as well as financial incentives um, as they pay people for work every day that they're in the transitional job. Um, they're trying to enroll people quickly after release, and they're doing regular assessments um, to track progress on job readiness so that they know when people are ready to move to the next stage and actually get connected with full-time unsubsidized employment. So really a, a comprehensive, intensive approach. And what they found, um, so this kind of goes back to the earlier point, is that the program has a very strong impact on recidivism for high-risk clients. It does not work as well with low-risk clients. So this is why it's so important um, that you think about who's getting placed in different types of programs. So that's part two. That's the implementation phase. And you are able to wrap up the, that phase when you um, go through implementation successfully, the fidelity, um, you're tracking client-level data, um, and you're able to then move to an evaluation stage. Um, so that's year three, where we would track the participants that are matched to programs based on their assessment, collecting client-level data, and evaluating the impact. So on page eight of your solicitation, you can see all of this laid out um, in a chart, so that's what this picture shows. As Dr. Dennis mentioned, um, there's not funding directly provided for this grant. It's all in-kind services in terms of the data collection capacity, assessment, um, reform, support provided in, in um, the form of technical assistance from both us here at the Justice Center and our partners. And so that TA will look, um, will have multiple dimensions to it. Policy guidance, um, data analysis, as I mentioned. We also will be doing training to help build program capacity. So we'll have national experts that can do trainings with your providers. Um, and evaluation will be supported by, um, we'll be funding a third-party evaluation. So just an example of, of our partners in TA, the National Institute of Corrections that does a significant amount of work around um, improving employment outcomes for folks with criminal records, um, has offered to do with offender employment retention um, practitioner curriculum, so focuses on principles and practices around this issue for the pilot site. So that's just one example of the type of TA that would be at your disposal under this pilot project. So that, again, is a quick summary of what the actual pilot project would look like, what you could expect if you were chosen to be a pilot site. I'm now going to transition into more of the details of just the application process. So what do you need to do um, to prepare yourself to submit an application to be a pilot project if you're so interested after um, hearing all about what it looks like? So for starters, who can apply? As I mentioned, it's open to state, county, or municipal jurisdictions, um, and we want the lead applicants to be um, definitely the corrections agency that has supervising authority, um, and also ideally a community-based partner 
that provides employment um, or workforce services for the reactive population. So that could be either a, a state agency or a nonprofit agency. We also want to make sure that there's demonstrated support from the chief executive of the targeted jurisdiction. So if you're a state applying, your governor signing on, if you're a, um, a city having the mayor sign on, just that demonstrated support from policymakers that this is an, an initiative that they will be behind um, and support for the long two years that it will take to implement. Um, this is critical to the success in New York State. Um, and as you can tell, it's a very intensive process. So we want to make sure that we have all the right policymakers on board. How do you apply? Um, the solicitation asks for a letter of interest. And the letter of interest essentially is your application. It is a 10-page narrative describing why you want to be a pilot site um, and also uh, what your capacity looks like um, to, uh, to implement and be a pilot site. So we're going to walk through what needs to go into that letter, um, both the procedural requirements, more of the substantive requirements, and, and what it takes to stand out as an applicant. So uh, procedurally, um, this is all written in the solicitation, but you'll just want to submit kind of a 10-page um, double-space, 12-point font uh, uh, letter. <clears throat> More importantly, the substantive requirements, um, you are going to want to include information about your implementation capability, um, your ability to support an evaluation, and your letters of support from all the stakeholders that would be involved. So let's start with implementation capability. These are all the factors um, that, based on our experience working with New York State um, and talking about the white paper out in the field, we kind of identified as essential to being able to implement a client matching system um, along the lines of, of the white paper. And so these are the sorts of things you're going to want to demonstrate to us that you will be able to support as selected as a pilot site. And this will really drive the bulk of our decision making in terms of who gets selected. So obviously we don't expect you to have everything in place that would defeat the purpose of a pilot site. So you need to be able to um, demonstrate that you will be able to have assessment information or implement things that are missing um, if you don't currently have them in place. So it's really a commitment to um, making these things available through the pilot site process as we move forward. And so um, it's indicated here in red font where we actually ask you to attach some documentation um, that demonstrates your uh, capacity around these different areas. And again, this is all uh, enumerated in the solicitation, which you should have access to um, right now. Evaluation support, very similar. Um, you know, in order for the pilot sites to have um, the sort of results that we can take and inform the field with, we need to ensure there's a good evaluation. And so that requires a commitment um, by you as a pilot site to work with our research staff to maintain client-level electronic records for the target population that you're serving. Um, to provide access to that data and to also make the connections to find the recidivism data for those individuals. Um, to provide the necessary data to do some of the prep work that I talked about, data about the um, target population characteristics, data about your um, service providers, that sort of information. We also ask that um, you be able to talk with the staff involved um, as well as the target population being served to understand how this is important for them. Um, and that we can do exit interviews along those lines. So again, these are you know, pretty basic expectations for evaluation. We just ask in your letter that you make it very clear that you're committed to um, providing this kind of support as a pilot site. Lastly, in terms of substantive requirements, um, we're going to want to submit letters of support. So as I mentioned, at a minimum, you need your community-based providers um, and your criminal justice or corrections agency um, to submit a letter of support as, as kind of the lead applicants for the project. So that's kind of your basics. Um, but as you can see here, uh, the scale will certainly tilt in your favor if you have some additional demonstrated support within your jurisdiction for the efforts. And so as I mentioned, having the chief executive of the state, city, or county, um, or other policymakers submit letters of support, that will definitely help your case. Um, having the executive director of your workforce uh, board or other um, workforce development uh, organizations submit a letter will definitely help your case. Um, it's not listed here, but um, business, the business community as well um, should definitely be um, submit letters of support if this is something that they are interested in, as well as other community-based organizations that you'd be partnering with in the effort. 
Um, something to note, if you currently, or if an organization in your jurisdiction is the recipient of an active Bureau of Justice Assistance Second Chance Act grant, um, or a Department of Labor Reintegration of Ex-Offender or RECSO grant, um, that will give you some priority consideration. We just asked that in your letter you actually talk about how being a pilot site would be enhanced by having that grant at your disposal. Um, and so we'll actually be reaching out to those sites um, that have both Second Chance Act and Rexo funding directly. Um, but definitely um, reach out to organizations in your jurisdiction if you know that they have a Second Chance Act or Rexo funding um, to let them know about this opportunity. So um, here's just the structure of what your letter will actually look like to meet all of these requirements. You know, the first page should, um, you know, explain why you're interested in being a pilot site. Um, that should talk about the commitment of leadership, the interest in the issue, why um, it's important from your perspective to have this evidence-based approach to reentering and employment. The next five pages um, should really dive into how your jurisdiction meets the criteria um, that I outlined in the slide above. So how are you able um, to support the growth sort of expectations um, that are asked of the pilot site. Um, and then lastly, um, that you have the, the capacity and ability to support the TA activities. So, again, all of this is detailed in your solicitation, um, but this is the format that you'll want your letter to take. So that wraps up uh, the pilot project and the application process. And there was a lot of information to pack into a one-hour webinar, um, but I do want to preserve the time that we have um, for questions. So I'm going to just quickly go through kind of the, the next steps in terms of selection process. The deadline, as I mentioned, is August 15th um, at midnight, and you should actually email those applications directly to me. Um, my email is listed there. The selection process will be iterative. Um, so based on the submissions that we receive, uh, we'll go through and, and based on the quality of the letters, identify a subset of sites that are finalists um, based on your commitment, your ability to implement the white paper um, and dedication to the project. Um, those sites will then be contacted for follow-up calls or on-site visits. So we want to make sure that the necessary resources are available in the community and that you really have that um, broad support that you need to implement the project. From there, uh, we'll narrow it down to kind of the, the best qualified sites. And again, we're really defining that as having the most commitment and the most capacity um, to do some of the things that the white paper supports and then make a final selection in partnership with um, our federal partners and the Annie KC Foundation. So that's what you can expect. So applications are due on August 15th, so it'll be next couple months um, after that um, before you hear who the final sites are. So you can expect that around late September. So that is uh, our webinar for today. Um, at this point, um, we're going to go through some of the questions that we have received. Please feel free to continue to uh, add them to the chat window. Um, I think it'll be tough to get through everything in 30 minutes, um, but we will do our very best to get through the ones that we can. And again, my contact information is here, as well as my co uh, my coworker Angela Pelosa, and she can also be contacted if for any reason you have a hard time getting a hold of me. So between the two of us, um, you should certainly be able to give any follow-up questions you have answered. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and answer a few of the questions that we've received. Um, so uh, first question um, is asking whether or not um, we would be able to share best practices to assist with this project, regardless of whether or not um, a site is selected as a pilot site. It's a good question. Um, the National Entry Resource Center does provide, um, you know, broad-based recommendations and support um, for any study who contacts us asking for it. Obviously, the intensity would be lower um, and our ability to come on site and work with you might be limited, but we'd be more than help, happy to connect you with other resources, talk about your programming, and see if there's a way that we can provide some distance-based TA. So absolutely, if this is something you're interested in in terms of a model, but you're not supposed to as a pilot site or not ready to be a pilot site, go ahead and, and reach out to us and we'll help you how we can. Another question, if you're currently involved in reentry but you're interested in working with this program, um, who would you contact? And that's another great question. Um, a big part of your application process is getting all the right stakeholders on the same page about the opportunity. And so my recommendation to you uh, would be to first talk to 
um, the corrections agency in your jurisdiction, as they are required to be the lead applicant. So whether that's a jail, um, county probation, the State Department of Correction, try to contact those folks and see um, if they're interested. Um, also look for other providers in the community and see if, if you can start to build some momentum there. Um, if you're really having a hard time identifying the right people, please reach out to us. A lot of times we actually know a lot of folks in different jurisdictions. We might be able to help connect you with somebody that would be of assistance. There's another question here about how the results of the pilot site would be used upon completion. Um, another good question. I, as we mentioned, it's very much our intention that the pilot sites um, are going to result in evaluation results that are going to inform the larger field. So certainly this would be public data, and so by committing to the pilot site, we're going to ask that you be comfortable with the evaluation results from your site being, um, you know, written up into a documentation uh, that was publicly available to the field. Um, and, you know, we would obviously work closely with you to make sure the data is valid and that the evaluation results are accurate. So that would be publicly available information. So the question here um, about criminogenic needs and what tools can be used um, to assess criminogenic needs. Very good question, um, and one that obviously you have to work on with your site if you are selected. Um, there's a number of different criminogenic risk and need assessment tools out there. Um, it's not really so much about the name of the tool, it's about um, what underlies the tool. Does it um, meet certain criteria in terms of capturing the right factors? Um, is it validated? Is it going to actually work and predict recidivism? Um, has it been normed for the population that you're working with? So, you know, does it work for our population? So these are the questions you need to ask around the risk assessment. So it's a very complex question um, and one that I'd be happy to some follow-up information about, but this is the sort of thing that we would um, work directly with a pilot site, uh, a potential pilot site to understand before making a final decision. Again, I actually think this is a place where reaching out to your uh, the collections agency in your jurisdiction might be helpful as well. They can probably tell you what tool that they use. So another question, uh, is there any information available uh, relative to the effects on low-risk offenders um, when they've been placed in program with high-risk offenders? So um, that very much is uh, kind of the data research that we showed earlier um, with kind of the bars uh, for high-risk people going up good results and for low-risk people going down bad results. And, the takeaway, again, is that if you, if you mix these individuals in the same program and it's an intensive setting, you can have uh, negative effects to lower clients. So um, if it, you're interested in any of the research on that particular issue, please follow up and we'd be happy to send you some articles about that. There is a question here about, um, you know, if you're interested in just sharing information um, about your program or data you have or successes you've had with us. We are constantly trying to collect um, success stories from the field. And we know that um, although a comprehensive approach like this that kind of has all the different players on the, at the table working together with you, so many pieces of this of this white like, paper is built on the successes that you've already happening in the field, the really great programs that are out there, the corrections agencies that are doing a wonderful job using assessments um, to, uh, to match people to the right services. We're certainly not reinventing the wheel here. And so if you have success stories in line with what I described on the white paper, please submit them to us. Um, and we'd be happy to highlight you um, on the National Entry Resource Center website or on, um, on our employment project site to talk about what you've accomplished. So please send those in. So the question, um, does any state, county, or municipal jurisdiction include tribal governmental organizations, um, or could a state or federal corrections agency be the lead um, and the target population be tribal members? So it's a great question, and I apologize if that was unclear in my webinar. There is no restriction on um, tribal entities applying, so please feel free to do that. Um, there may be some limits in terms of federal agencies. Um, if you're partnering with a local jurisdiction in the project, that should be okay. But I'm going to ask if you're a, a federal person looking into the project, please contact me directly and we can talk to your specific circumstances to see um, if you would be eligible for this opportunity. The question here now, um, given the need to evaluate um, the car as a significant population size, um, what would be suggested for a successful pilot? Um, 
as I mentioned, the exact number of people served uh, would be determined by the capacity. But yes, um, to do a true evaluation, we're going to need decent numbers. And um, it's hard to say exactly offhand what that would look like. Um, my inclination is to say a minimum of about 200 people served um, to get the right number of people to have kind of strong significance without evaluation results. Um, uh, I think that's the, the sort of thing that um, that we could provide some follow-up information about um, if they're interested. But I would assume, you know, 200 folks minimum. Um, I know that in New York State, in their pilot efforts, they're actually going to hit closer to 2,000 people in the effort. So it's a pretty large pilot project. So um, that would actually be uh, closer to the numbers that would be ideal. Um, so I'm just looking at the minimum there. Another question um, about eligibility. Um, do we have to currently be conducting a risk needs assessment, or can that be planned during the planning capacity building in phase one? Um, this is a great question and one that um, I am hopeful doesn't affect too many people negatively. Um, there, if there's no risk or needs assessment being used in your jurisdiction, um, it's going to be a real challenge um, to get one implemented in time to support the pilot project. Um, getting a risk and needs assessment in place is a very resource-intensive initiative. Um, the tools themselves cost money. Um, the evaluation that it takes to actually validate and norm the tool, which is kind of a, a process that you use to make sure the tool works for your population, that's intensive. Um, so it would be very hard for us to do a pilot site um, that has no risk and needs assessment available in the community. I think you might be surprised, um, you know, how many times corrections agencies have a risk and needs assessment tool that maybe community providers just aren't aware of. So, uh, again, before you assume you don't have one, reach out to your corrections partners and see what's available. Um, but unfortunately, if there's just no risk and needs assessment available in your jurisdiction, it's going to be very hard for us to work with you at the pilot site. Another question is here, would time of jails and partnerships with uh, the Department of Corrections be considered um, or is the focus only on one um, prison? So um, we are absolutely kind of flexible on, you know, whether the target population is coming out of multiple facilities. Um, you know, we could potentially also work with, with more diverse populations, people coming out of prison um, and, you know, people on probation, depending on uh, – all of the right partners being at the table, essentially. Um, obviously, there's some complexity with working with very different populations if they're being supervised by different agencies. So it's a matter of coordination there. Um, but really, the only uh, you know hard uh, limit that we have is that all the folks need to be coming back to the target jurisdiction that we're focused on. Um, I expect that it's likely that we would be we would be working with multiple facilities that are dumping people out um, to that community that you're working with, multiple prisons or multiple jails. I cannot say definitively that we would be able to work with both a jail and a prison population, say, because the systems are so different. But we'd be definitely open to having a conversation with you about it if you feel that those systems are really well coordinated and can work well together. So. Um, that, that piece, uh, I'm not going to definitively know, but I would recommend you reach out and, and let us know your specific circumstances, and we can talk that through with you. Another question here, um, asking about um, mentoring and whether or not mentoring is a factor that would enhance an application. Um, so we've obviously been focused very specifically on the reentry and employment um, services that go into this. But the reality is that there's a whole wraparound, um, a case, wraparound case management and support that's needed to help somebody successfully transition home from prison and jail. Um, and the white paper does talk about um, all of those other wraparound supports that go into an effort like that. So if you have other reentry services in your community, whether it's mentoring, um, you know, housing, other supports that um, would ultimately assist the individuals that you're working with, Absolutely, you should um, you should talk about those resources in your application. I wouldn't make it the primary focus of your letter of interest, but what I would potentially, you know, what might make sense is to include letters of support from those different organizations, explaining how their services, mentoring, housing, et cetera, would be a supplement to the larger initiative. So yes, um, I definitely think that it would make sense um, to talk about some of those things. question here, uh, which is a great one and one that comes up a lot, is how can a program spend more time working with high-risk participants on job readiness when school requires immediate employment? Any suggestions? Um, 
So this is the sort of issue that we would actually direct uh, tackle head on in the pilot site and why we require the corrections agency that has supervising authority be the lead applicant on your grant. Um, we want to make sure that those folks have a very clear understanding of what they're getting into um, and, and what the, the goal of the pilot site would look like um, and be willing to kind of work with us around um, conditions of supervision and expectations um, to make sure that it promotes the successful transition um, out. I think what oftentimes happens uh, is that people are violated or revoked for not finding employment because it's not clear that anything is happening in the alternative. Um, and I think that a lot of times corrections agencies are very open to being flexible if they know that somebody is enrolled in a program full time that's kind of building them up towards to a long time long term excuse me employment opportunity. Um, and so really uh, that that's the sort of thing that your corrections agency would need to work with us on, and that we would want to make sure we address um, in the pilot site. There's always going to be certain restrictions and conditions that are set in stone, and, and we'll work around those. Um, you know, a lot of times what you can do. Similar to um, kind of the Center for Employment Opportunities model is these transitional jobs or subsidized employment as a way to get people, you know, on paper employed to continue to work on these job readiness factors, build up their skills so that, you know, when they are actually kind of done with the program and moving into kind of stable unsubsidized employment, um, just more, you know, traditional employment, they have those skills, those skills were developed. So, there's a lot of different ways you can kind of work around that challenge, but you, you really, um, whoever asked that question, you certainly um, hit on a point that I think is challenging for a lot of folks and one that we'd want to tackle head on with this pilot site project. Another question, um, is there a scale on the number of best pilot sites to be selected, um, minimum and maximum? Um, I'm not sure if that's in reference to kind of the, how we're going to pull down the numbers. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the final selection will be, at this point, um, two sites. Um, but uh, in terms of how many sites we reach out to during that first um, that first wave, um, it, quite frankly, it comes down to the quality of the proposal we receive. Um, I think if we see a lot of really, um, you know, promising sites, we'll probably want to reach out to, to you know, 10 or 20 or 30 even um, to see who is the strongest. If it's weaker, then maybe we, we only reach out to 5 or 10. So it's hard to give a firm number on that. Um, but, you know, I, I will say that we will make sure to be in contact with anybody who applies right away to let you know your status one way or the other so you won't be left hanging in limbo as we go through this uh, multi-month selection process. All right, another question here. Um, is the intention that all individuals would go through a pathway, or should individuals be randomly assigned to be included or not? Uh, fantastic question, um, and one that I didn't speak to specifically. I alluded to the fact that we want to do uh, a rigorous evaluation. I did not talk about the design. And so, yes, um, there would have to be um, a way to have a control group um, to demonstrate um, that, that this shift in how you're matching people to services um, is working. And so I know there's oftentimes some reservations about having control groups that are randomly assigned about concerns about not delivering services. Um, what I would say is that um, for the purpose of the pilot, for it to truly be a learning opportunity, we're going to have to have that kind of high rigor of evaluation. Um, we'll certainly do our best to um, kind of accommodate concerns about people accessing the treatment that they need. In New York City, um, They've been able to do an evaluation, a controlled evaluation, without denying people who are requesting services, the services that they've asked for. Um, so it definitely is doable, um, and we will definitely work closely with you on that. But the, the short answer to your question is yes, we would, would be looking to identify, um, you know, either use random assignment or identify a very strong control group to do that evaluation. Um, so it's a question clarifying the name of the New York State Pilot Program. Um, so the overarching initiative that kicked off our pilot site work uh, is called Work for Success. So it was an executive uh, order of the governor to establish the uh, Work for Success Committee. And if you Google Work for Success New York State, um, they have a website that you should find pretty easily that talks about a lot of um, their successes and, and efforts to date. I just touched on some of the client matching work that happened under Work for Success. Um, there's actually a lot of other initiatives I've taken on, including a very um, 
a very impactful and comprehensive uh, business engagement strategy. So that's all on their website, and I'd recommend you, you take a look. Again, just Google New York State work to success, and you should be able to find all that information. Um, there's a question about the lead applicant, um, whether or not the corrections agency or jail or prison needs to be the lead applicant or if they can be a partner or have several partners co-lead. So we are more than open to having co-applicants. Um, in fact, we encourage it. So the only hard requirement is that the corrections agency is one of those uh, co-applicants, but if they want to submit a letter of interest on behalf of the corrections agency and two, three, or even seven providers in the community that have really um, engaged in, in writing the proposal, then absolutely, please, um, the more, from our perspective, the more the merrier on this application. Another question here, once an agency is selected, um, if the target population, quote, ages out of supervision during the course of the pilot, can some or all of the individuals um, be rotating in the pilot. So um, I'm trying to interpret this here, and, and it, in terms of the length of time they have on supervision, um, what we'll have to do is set some uh, benchmarks or uh, requirements on that so that we make sure that people um, are able to go through the referral process and um, be under supervision while they're going through the program that they're matched to. Um, a big part of, of the white paper that we'll want to focus on that I didn't touch on a lot during the, the webinar here is just the ongoing coordination between the supervising officer and uh, the service provider. Um, it's so critically important that both of those folks are on the same page, that the provider is has information about the, the individual supervision status and how they're doing on supervision. And conversely, that the supervising officer knows the program, knows how well the client is doing, is able to assist when there's conflicts that are affecting the success in the program, even things like adjusting for a few times or um, meeting, you know, mandatory meeting requirements with the officer to accommodate program participation. These are all the sorts of um, kind of nitty-gritty implementation challenges that we'll be working directly with you um, to, to help address. Um, my point being um, that we really need people to be under supervision for that model to work. And so there may be um, a, a benchmark that says folks that are counted in the pilot project must have six months of supervision uh, upon release um, and to ensure that they, they have that coordination as possible. So um, my guess would be six months of supervision. It's possible that could be a little bit longer. Um, another question here, um, is technical support going to be given um, regarding already existing vocational programming in our correctional facilities to assist in bridging training and et cetera? Um, that's a really fantastic question. Um, and one, you know, the model, as we've discussed, is very focused on kind of the post or the pre-release assessment that's used to then match people to services in the community and to facilitate that transition out. However, um, as we all know, so much goes into preparing somebody for work before they uh, leave prison or jail, and a lot of prisons and jails have done a great job of building their capacity to provide those services. We very much want those things to be integrated into the pilot site in a meaningful way. So how can we make sure that the vocational training somebody receives is um, actually being used when somebody gets out? Are we matching them to the right type of employment opportunity? Are we matching them to a program that builds on those skills? as opposed to, you know, starts from scratch. So, yes, we will take all of that into consideration. I think if you have strong vocational or workforce programming in your prisons or jails, you should um, talk about that in your application. That, that very much goes to your capacity for implementation. Um, and, you know, we can, we can definitely kind of integrate all of that under the pilot project. Um, I didn't mention this during the presentation, but New York State also has done a lot around their vocational programming in prison as part of work for success. So that was kind of a third prong to their effort. In addition to client matching, it was looking at how we can build up um, our technical vocational skills for people before they leave. So they're more job ready when they get out. Um, so yes, yeah, that would, would certainly be beneficial for you to talk about if you have those services. And we would definitely want to connect that into the pilot site in a meaningful way. Another question, um, are there any religious limitations or would a faith-based organization be able to take part in the pilot program? Um, there's no restrictions on being, um, you know, a faith-based reentry program. We, our, our standard um, 
for a provider to be part of this referral network is the quality of the services that we provide. Um, we want to match people to services that we that are going to be impactful and are going to help improve the target population's outcome along the dimensions of, you know, employment and, and recidivism outcomes. Um, and I think there's a lot of intermediate measures that go into that as well. Um, you know, are people more stable? Um, are they not violating supervision rights? So there's a lot that goes into what we evaluate as success. But um, the, the threshold for whether or not a program, um, you know, should be part of the, the pilot model um, and an active partner in the process, it, it comes down to whether or not you're delivering, you know, quality programming. And as I mentioned earlier, our partnerships with the National Institute of Corrections and other um, other trainers in the field is intended to work with programs that maybe need some assistance. So we may be doing some good work, but you would benefit from some staff training on what evidence-based practices are and how to implement them. Those are the sorts of things we try to build with you. So if you're worried that your program doesn't meet that threshold now, those are you shouldn't apply. Um, but, you know, we'd want to work with you to see um, how we can help build that capacity. So no restrictions on faith-based organizations. It all comes down to the quality of the services that you're providing or open to providing to the target population. Uh, I had a question from a RECSO grantee, and um, I imagine there's others on the call as well, about whether or not you'd be able to revise your program to fit into your target population. So the good news for you is that the Department of Labor um, and Jackie Freeman, who oversees the RECSO program, is a very active partner, partner of ours, um, and I know that they're very supportive of the pilot site work. Um, that said, there's obviously always rules and restrictions around how much you can change um, your program that's grant funded, so I'm not going to give you a direct answer now, um, but that's the sort of thing that I think makes sense for you to, to contact me offline and we can connect with the folks at Rexo and, and talk about exactly how, how much of a change you're thinking about um, and, and whether that would work um, for your grant. So please, whoever asked that question about the Rexo grant structure, um, reach out to me separately and we can have a conversation about that. Um, my guess is that some adjustments um, to accommodate the pilot site would be supported. A wholesale re reworking of the program might cause some problems. All right, another question. Um, is there a desired enrollment type for this programming, uh, wanting group enrollments or individual enrollments, or is that the program decision? So um, that's something that we're not specific on um, for the pilot at this point. This is the sort of issue we'd want to work through during that one-year planning phase. Um, whether or not you enroll people in your group, in your program as groups or individuals, really should be driven by your program design. Does it work better with group enrollment? Does it work better with individual enrollment? Um, my guess is that it could be flexible. Um, you know, the pilot site, the, the client matching model is asking that people are put in the right program based on their, their assessed needs. Um, so you could do that assessment individually and then group people to send them to a program, uh, you know, on a weekly or monthly basis, or you could have them coming in one at a time on, on kind of a rolling basis. So it's very much flexible to work with how your program is structured. Um, another question here, may a nonprofit uh, that is contracted by the Department of Corrections, they're contracted by uh, the Corrections Agency, facilitate the reentry of inmates into the community um, to facilitate the reentry of inmates in the community be considered a lead applicant. So to clarify that again, so a nonprofit agency that is directly contracted by the Department of Corrections um, to facilitate uh, transition to the community, so maybe a halfway house or, or um, workhouse or a provider like that, could you be the lead applicant? Um, I would still, we would still want to have the corrections agency signed on as a co lead applicant. And the reason for that is, again, kind of that supervisory role once the person would transition out of that halfway house or workhouse. Um, and so that's one piece. So you'd want to have a continuum with the supervising uh, agency. It's also, you know, very feasible that the pilot site would target individuals more broadly than just the ones coming to your one select halfway house that you're working with. So, in that case, um, you should certainly be a co-lead applicant, but I would recommend having the, um, the higher ups at the Department of Corrections that you're contracting with also sign on as lead applicants for the grant. All right, I think we're getting down to our final questions here. Um, how do you hope to affect the national dialogue as a result of the pilot? Um, that's a wonderful question and one we kind of touched on a little bit. Um, you know, I think from our perspective as the Council of State Government's Justice Center, um, this is an opportunity um, to really demonstrate 
what it is to take best practices from two fields that are often working in parallel um, and to truly integrate that in a meaningful way and to demonstrate the impact of that. And so the takeaway from all this experience would be better TA and resources for the field, better guidance on how to implement this type of, of uh, approach, um, you know, restructuring how we talk to grantees or how grants grant programs are structured to accommodate this approach. But I know, Dr. Dennis, if you're still on the call, if you want to add anything in terms of your perspective from the from the feds about, um, you know, the expectations of the national impact of this project. Well, I, I think the only thing I would say is just to, to reinforce what you said is that one of the things the PKA has been doing uh, under the Second Chance Act for the last six years now is, is trying to uh, develop these resources that can be shared nationally. And we we knew that even though we've put significant resources into the council state governments, uh, Justice Center, and they have done a marvelous job running the National Reentry Resource Center, and they've provided technical assistance to all of our second chance grantees. The real benefit of this is being, I think I heard someone ask earlier about best practice, is that you must be able to look at, at this type of work, you know, actually in operation in the field and then make sure that that information is able to be disseminated. I also believe that with the interest right now uh, on the part of this administration, that successful uh, implementation in this pilot site is certainly going to motivate the Office of Management and Budget and the White House Domestic Policy Council, as well as our many friends, bipartisan friends on the Hill, to, you know, to continue to put resources into programs that we show are effective and uh, remove barriers to reentry. So, as I, as I said earlier, I think it's going to be an exciting thing to be a part of if I were out in the field as a director of corrections or as someone who was pulling together a community collaborative to, to address folks returning citizens to my community, I would be really excited about having the opportunity to participate, and I hope everyone is. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, so we have just a few minutes left, so any last-minute last questions, please throw them in. Um, one more here. Um, Question about whether the conflict of interest of the corrections agency has an HRSA grant um, and is interested in applying. We haven't set any restrictions at this stage um, in terms of having multiple grants and also being part of the pilot site opportunity. I think what we want to do, um, when you, if you were to apply, just to talk about the other initiatives you might have going on in the state that could conflict. Um, with the model that we're hoping to apply, we obviously don't want to have any um, conflicts of interest in terms of implementation, but if it seems like it's a separate effort or complementary, I don't think there's any reason to have a blanket restriction on having other grants or other initiatives happening. So, again, um, if, you have a, if you'd like more details on, on that response, or um, please feel free to reach out to me directly. But um, no, no blanket rules about um, not being able to have other grants and also be a pilot site. Right? Okay. Well, it is now 3.25. Um, I believe we've gotten through all of the questions that were posed, um, so that's good news. But again, if you think of something later or we missed anything that you, you're curious about, don't hesitate to reach out to either myself or to Angela, um, and our contact information is listed here. Um, this concludes today's webinar. So um, I just ask that after you exit the webinar, um, you complete a very brief survey that will appear on your screen um, about the webinar. It just makes, it helps us as the National Rancher Resource Center improve the services that we offer. So we really appreciate you taking just a few seconds to complete that survey. Um, as Sean mentioned, uh, typed into the Q&A box, we will make sure that you receive a recording of the presentation as well as the PDF of the PowerPoint slides, um, hopefully later this week. So, um, and we'll also make those links available on our website um, at csgjusticecenter.org slash NRC. Um, lastly, uh, as I mentioned, sign up for our newsletter if you haven't. That's a great way to get information about pilot site opportunities, grant funding, um, not just from us, but from other resources as well on an ongoing basis. So with that, thank you all very much for your participation and for your interest in the pilot site, and we are very much excited um, to see your applications come in. Um, please contact me if you have any additional questions. Thank you.